So today we're going to learn how to use tile maps in auto tiles. Now this is not a beginner's course on how to make auto tiles. We're going to focus on how to use them. We're going to take a look at a few examples of 2x2 two two auto tiles and 3x3 three three auto tiles. Then we're going to look at collisions with tile maps that will uh, like this example of not being able to go in the water but being able to go across the bridge. To accomplish that, we're going to look at some signals and some concatenation examples. Then we'll get to the shader that will allow you to be partially visible when you're behind a cliff. And lastly, we'll just go over a few quick tips on how to deal with some artifacts that often happen in tile maps. So we'll take a quick look at the scene tree. And these are all faded because it is an inherited scene. So I have a lot of different categories of tile maps that I have made for a couple reasons. It's easier to work with and uh, differentiate between the ground and the water when they're in different tile maps. But also, if I put every single tile into the same tile set, I'd have one tile set that has over a hundred different tiles. So this just makes it a little bit more manageable. When I go to the water, I know I'm going to have the water. When I go to the ground, I have a few options for ground. I have cliffs. I have some man-made things and roads. And so it's easier to find what you're looking for when you separate everything like this. Now a quick look at these tile maps. So I have this rope here. And basically this is just a quick uh, three by three auto tile. I'm only using these three squares with the rope in it, but this is saying that this tile has tiles below it, this tile has above and below, and this tile has above. So what that looks like is a quick um, rope that will update as you go. Now in the same vein, I have another type of ladder but I also have just a scarecrow. And now it sounds a little bit silly to have an auto tile just for a scarecrow, but it makes it for a very quick development of levels. It takes like a minute on the front end to make the auto tile, but then when you are working, you can just grab your scarecrow and be like, boom, I got it. Instead of having to look over here for the top and then the bottom, whether it's a single tile or an atlas, you still have to click multiple times. This way, I can just be like, boom, uh, I've got a scarecrow. Now, it does have limitations. It doesn't really work very well when you have them right next to each other because it doesn't know what to do. Like I said, it makes the workflow a lot faster when you're developing your levels. So an even better example, I believe, is this bridge. I have a 2x2 two two auto tile set up. This basically means that there's going to be a tile to the right and to the bottom. This is There's left, right, and bottom. Uh, when it's completely filled in, there's going to be tiles all the way around it. So then let's just compare that with an atlas after you set up this auto tile. So I have here the atlas form of that bridge, and I will make it as easy as possible for me. So I have... Not that long, but a lot of clicks. And we're just going to compare that to the auto tile that I set up. Now this bridge, go like this. Boom, I've got a bridge. Boom, I've got a bridge. If I want to change it, I can just it just automatically updates and that's it's just super handy. So when it comes to collisions, the water that I have in my scene, each square is just completely full because I don't want the person to walk on any part of the water. But in this instance, I have a bridge and I want them to be walk I want the person to be able to walk down the middle of the bridge, but I don't really want them to be able to walk up here where there really isn't actually a bridge, so I did partial uh, collision shapes. So when you have collision shapes with your water, it would typically be enough just to have it interact with the player directly with the physics engine. But I wanted to be able to not go in the water here, but go across the bridge, which if you can't go in the water, the physics engine would block movement of the player when he tries to cross the bridge. So I had to do something that was a little bit more elaborate, um, hence the little areas around the player. Now before we get started, it's important for everyone to know how 
the physics layers work. Um, we're going to be particularly looking at the bridges and the water and being able to know the difference between the layer and the mask. The layer is the layer that the node is in, so the player node will be in the player, but it will also interact with the environment. Now, like I said, uh, typically it would be enough just to have it interact with the water, so you can't go in the water, but like I said, to be able to use the bridges, that kind of causes problems. So I created some checks with some areas to see if there is water and to check to see if there is a bridge. So all it is is a bunch of area 2Ds, and the water check is basically the same as the bridge check. You can kind of see they're overlapping a little bit. We'll just stick with the water check. Each water check sends a signal to actually the same function in the script. So let's take a look at the script. Before we look at that function, I want you to know that these variables exist. Looking just at the water, we have water up, water down, water left, water right. Now they all start with water, which is important. Uh, when we look at the function. So now that you know that these variables exist, let's take a look at the signal. Now I said that all of these signals are going to point to the same function. Even the water check up, the water check down, the water check right, and the water check left, they're all going to point to the same function for the entered and then the same function for the exited. And if you want to take a look at that when you've made it in the editor, you can right click it and click edit. This signal has an extra string, and then you click add, which is up. And when you send that to here, it, you will always send the body that it overlapped with the area, but then it'll automatically make another argument that's called argument number one or something like that. And I just changed it to dir for direction. And if the up area is overlapped, then it will the dir will be up if it's down, It'll send down, and then this is a concatenation. So instead of just having, uh, say, water up equals true, we're going to use the set function so we can use a string and concatenate it. That way we only need to use one function, opposed to having water check up body entered, water check down body entered, and having just a ton of signal functions at the end of the script. So what this means is, if you remember, every single one of those variables started with water, then the part that we want to change is going to be the percent sign %s, and then after that string, we're going to do percent sign %dir. So when we get up through the signal, it's going to replace this percent sign %s with up and right and left and up or down. Uh, and then we're going to set that to true. When it exits that body, it'll be false. And essentially the same exact thing happens for checking for the bridge, except the bridge areas, like I said, you have to watch out for what layer they're checking for. They're checking for bridges. The water is checking for the water. When you click the button to the right, it checks to see if there is a bridge. If there is a bridge, then I can move. If there is not, then it goes to the else, and it checks to see if there is not water. If there is not water, then I can move. Now this seems like it's a little bit backwards. It's a little bit confusing, but this was the shortest and most concise way that I could write the functions. So when you go click to the right, if there is water to the right, then it won't be able to move. But you can move the other directions because the other directions are using the other checks. So the bridge left, water left. I feel like it's a little bit awkward to say out loud, but in code, if you just look at it and see how it's working, it's pretty concise and clear. Let me know in the comments if I'm if I'm wrong. And then after you pick, figure out the input direction, you just move and slide it, normalized by the speed. So now let's take a look at that shader that allows you to be visible behind the cliffs. So I went to the cliffs. I set a material as a shader material, and I made a new shader. So here is the shader. We have the player position, which is a uniform, so we can set it each frame through the script in the map template, which we'll look at in just a second. The activation distance is going to be how big the circle of visibility is in the cliff. And then the varying screen position, it has to be a varying because we're going to check it each time in the vertex and it'll be different for each pixel. So 
we're going to find the screen position of each pixel. We have to do that in the vertex shader. And then once we find the position of that pixel, we're going to measure the distance to the player. If that distance is greater than the activation distance, we're just going to let it be. Uh, the alpha will be just one. And then if it is less, then we will use the same color and the same texture, but the alpha is going to vary between one and 0.2. So I, I didn't let it go below 0.2 because I always wanted it to be slightly visible. That way it looks like you're behind it still. Then if we take a look at the map template script, uh, we have a variable which we're going to set in the ready function. Instead of dealing with a whole bunch of crazy paths, I just use the git tree, git node in group. And if you look at the player, I added it to the player group. And then this returns an array so you can't just set it directly. You have to loop through it and set the player node as this variable. That way we have access to it later. And then we're going to find the player position by getting the git global transform with canvas.origin, which is just a long way to say where on the screen is the player. Then we're going to go to the cliffs material and set the shader param. That is the player position we created in the shader. If you remember the player position, we're going to set that to our calculation. And what you end up with is a little bit of visibility. So the last thing are just a few tips on how to deal with artifacts on your tile maps. This is a pretty common one. The artifacts are just these terrible lines. You can see exactly where the grid is, the squares. And we're gonna try and get rid of those. The easiest and most common way to just get rid of them is when you import an image, the filter is usually on by default. So turn that filter off on the image that is your tile set, re-import it, pretty much instantly you'll get rid of a lot of the artifacts. Now these artifacts are usually more of a problem if you zoom and have different zoom levels opposed to the exact pixel size of the sprites that you're using, but this can still help. Now the other thing I did was I went into the project settings and I went to the environment and I went to change the color. And you can use this little eyedropper to pick a color from the screen. But this makes it really dark because it's faded because you're in the settings, the project settings screen. If you want to get a more exact color, I just added a little placeholder node. I go over here into the visibility, go to modulate, and then you can use that little eyedropper here and say that, and we will copy and paste this number. Uh, then we will go to the environment again, and you just paste that little six digit number in. Click enter, and that'll give that to you. And uh, we don't really need that sprite anymore. That, we'll just delete that. And that'll change the background color to about the same as, you know, kind of hide a few of the other artifacts. Um, like I said, there's still going to be a few of them here. But overall, I think it helped quite a bit. So this is what it looks like right now. I'm hoping to work on this project a little bit more and say maybe climb this rope and a few other things. Uh, but uh, I was just getting too much information for me to keep track of. So I thought I'd make a video and update you on these ideas. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. Like I said, this was a lot of information for me to keep track of to, for making this video, so I probably missed something.